Welcome everyone to Wednesday Night at the Lab. I'm Tom Zinnan. I work here at the UW-Madison Biotechnology Center. I also work for UW Extension and Cooperative Extension. And on behalf of those folks and our other co-organizers, Wisconsin Public Television, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and the UW-Madison Science Alliance, thanks again for coming to Wednesday Night at the Lab. We do this every Wednesday night, 50 times a year. Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Ross Edwards, who is coming to us both from the Curtin University in Perth, Western Australia, and he's here as a visiting faculty member in our College of Engineering. Uh, he was born in Portland, Victoria, in Australia, and he went to PHS, Portland High School. <laughs> and then he went to MIT, the Royal MIT, the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology. <laughs> He made that joke, not me. Thank you. Okay. And then he got his PhD at the University of Tasmania. Does everybody know where Tasmania is? Wow, I did. It's in Hobart. And I'm going to look at the globe again to see if there's any more southern PhD granting institution in the world. <laughs> and appropriately, he got his PhD in Antarctic studies. Uh, I hope he'll talk to us a little bit about the Southern Ocean because, of course, the Australians know there's an ocean called the Southern Ocean. Tonight, he gets to talk to us about this great expeditionary science. It's entitled Dark Snow, Investigating Smoke on the Greenland Ice Sheet from a Zero-Emission Wind-Propelled Sled. It's a great pleasure to welcome Ross Edwards to Wednesday Night at the Lab. Please join me in welcoming Ross. Can you hear me? I think that's the first question. Um, well, first of all, thank you for uh, taking the time to come tonight. Um, I know it's 7 o'clock, is, is, uh, 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 it's getting late already. Um, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, this is a, it's a great honour. Um, tonight I'm going to talk about this trip uh, I took recently uh, across Antarctica, across, sorry, not across Antarctica, Antarctica across Greenland. Um, this is probably one of the craziest things I've done in my research career. Uh, and I'll explain a little bit about how this uh, came about, how I got involved in this. But um, to begin with, I'd just like to thank some of the people who have been, all organisations that have been involved that made this possible. Uh, we had some funding from the Dark Snow Project, which is a, a crowd uh, source, crowd funded um, project uh, based in uh, Copenhagen. Uh, this is the Inuit Wind Sled. This is the uh, organisation um, that actually came up with this craft that you'll, <laughs> you'll see later on. University of Copenhagen and, of course, University of Wisconsin. Uh, my research fellowship is through Curtin University. But the, the group that really made this trip possible would be uh, my family, uh, the Lydells and the Kunkels, some of whom are here, who kept it together a while away. Um, so this trip... Really, um, this is what I've been studying for the past few years. Uh, people, when people ask me what I do, am I a chemist, am I a physicist, am I an earth scientist, um, I'm really all of these things. And this is what I've been studying for the last uh, 20 years, or odd 20 years or more. This is, a, um, this is actually this is the earth as you will see it. If you're in the Lagrangian point, L1, which is a gravitational sweet spot between the Earth and the Sun, this is a real, this is the actual picture. This is not a computer simulation. This is a satellite. This is this NOAA deep, deep space um, climate observatory that's out about a million miles from the Earth. And you can log on to this. Uh, there's, there's the, uh, if you look up Epic Camera, NOAA, I do this daily. Um, well, I should be raking the leaves or doing something else. I'm probably probably uh, watching the Earth from a million miles away. But if you, if you look at these images, you really start to get a sense of what really is going on with the Earth's climate and how the climate works. What you see, you're seeing here right now is really um, a snapshot from May 23rd. This is the day that I landed on the ice. And you can see Greenland up here in the top. Here we go. Up here in the top, uh, sea ice and snow, clouds, etc. But what you can see is also, you can see the climate, Earth's climate system at work. In, in, rea in reality, what you're seeing here, though, is weather. 
So people often confuse weather and climate. You'll hear people picking up a snowball uh, early in the year and saying there's no climate warming or no climate change. But what they're really experiencing is weather. At one point in time in the Earth's, as in the Earth system. And um, as an Earth scientist, we think of climate as weather that's averaged over some long time period. And we think of the Earth as well. It's not usually one small area that we're really thinking about. Um, we're thinking about the whole Earth. The, really in, the nice thing about the poles is that we have a, an ice cap in Greenland uh, and a few other smaller ice caps around, and ice caps in Antarctica. And those ice caps are capturing climate and weather and atmospheric chemistry in the form of snowfall. And that snowfall's um, building up on the ice sheet, and we have records uh, that go back in Greenland that will go back over 100,000 years in some places of the daily snowfall, the chemistry, a bit of the atmosphere that's falling on the ice sheet. And so from my research, um, I'm interested in the Earth system. I'm interested in how the, the biosphere, the living parts of the Earth, um, uh, interact with the climate system and how the climate system interacts on those aspects of the Earth system. And so um, my, my work really started off uh, in the Southern Ocean when I was a PhD in Tasmania. And uh, I was looking at plankton in the ocean and the inter interrelationship um, of that plankton with desert dust blowing into the ocean, providing uh, nutrients for the, for the plankton. And as part of that research, I realized that um, one of the aspects I was missing was fire. I was researching dust, and I couldn't work out how the, um, some of the nutrients in the dust was being liberated uh, for plankton. And it turned out there are, there's an interaction between dust and fire. Um, fire producing smoke, smoke releasing uh, organic acids, organic acids which were eating the dust in the atmosphere as it was travelling through the air. And I realised that what I really wanted was a, a record of smoke, of fire, from these ice sheets. And at the time, we didn't have the technology to really do this properly. Um, and I spent a whole decade, I guess, trying to develop a, a method to do this. And uh, finally, I had a breakthrough, and uh, I developed a method that was about a million times more sensitive than anything that existed at the time. And that allowed us, for the first time, to get these very high temporal resolution records of, of smoke. Um, in these ice sheets, which I could relate back to this whole dust question. Anyway, <laughs> to move, move forward, this is the, um, this is the uh, team that was, I went on this, this crazy expedition. And this expedition for me was really to look for smoke, for me, was to look for smoke in the ice, in the snowpack. Um, I'd been up in the snowpack before and um, we travelled in a very conventional way, with, uh, in planes and other aircraft, and we had big generators, and we were producing a lot of smoke, <laughs> right? You can see where this is going. Um, and so this opportunity came, uh, came, came up to try and travel across the ice sheet without making smoke, without, um, without much combustion at all, without having de using diesel generators and things like that. And I thought, wow, this would be... A a great way to be able to clean, uh, collect snow really cleanly without getting smoke in it. Anyway, so so this is the this is the um, well, this is the Inuit wind sled here um, in the background. So this is this vehicle that we travelled in, and I'll talk a bit about that in a moment. But this is the uh, the wind sled team. Before I got to Greenland, I had never met these guys. <laughs> the story is getting a little bit even a bit more crazy. Um, so this is, uh, this is actually the leader of the, of the, of the team leader. This is um, Ramon Laramendi, the expedition leader. Uh, he's a Spanish polar adventure explorer. This guy walked to the North Pole uh, many years ago for SAS. In his 20s, he journeyed from uh, Greenland to Alaska by dog sled and kayak and back, I believe, during the winter, 14,000 kilometres. It took him three years. He, he said it took him a lifetime. It was a lifetime. 
uh, he's also taken, he, so he created this, this vehicle based on his experience. Um, he's also journeyed to the South Pole in this thing, unsupported. Um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's wild. Uh, this is uh, Nacho Garcia. He's an extreme filmmaker. Uh, there was, he's making a documentary about this um, vehicle. Uh, he was along filming. Uh, Ilo Morano, who's a polar and alpine guide, works in Antarctica and uh, in the mountains, uh, Spanish. And um, Jens Jacob Simonson, um, we call JJ. He's a Greenlander. He's a captain and a marine engineer. It turned out that actually this uh, vehicle is the closest thing to sailing that you ever find on the ice sheet. So it was... <laughs> It was uh, apt. And so we had a couple of goals um, for, this, for this trip. Um, the first, the tri trip happened in May 23rd to June 23rd, and we, we traversed about 750 miles across the ice sheet. Um, along the way, we stopped, we, we stopped at 13 research sites uh, where I collected snow samples, uh, dug pits for snow, and then, then also took some tube samples where tubes of tubed into the ice for, for this uh, black carbon. And uh, there was some atmospheric sampling going on as well as uh, meteorology and uh, ice radar. So this is back to the fire thing, okay. So, um, so my, my obsession with fire and smoke is really about these little black particles of soot that are in the smoke. They're, they're nanoparticles, they're on you right now. You're, they're in your hair, they're on, they're, they cover every surface of the earth. There's zillions of them around and um, you don't see them uh, except when there's a fire or some kind of smoke. So it comes from wildfires, it comes from any kind of biomass burning, comes out of your car, anything is, anything is burning, fossil fuels. And before I went on this trip, I, I gave a talk at the, um, the Water Science Laboratory about you know, this, this trip to some students and I said, the one thing is that I'm, we really uh, think is going to happen in the future is that there's going to be more and more burning in the north, in the, in the, uh, in the Canada, in the Alaska, in the Siberian forests. And just as I was coming back, these fires started in British Columbia, some of the biggest fires uh, ever recorded in British Columbia. And um, uh, the smoke did arrive in Greenland, actually, after I left. But this is this big river of smoke that is filling up the northern um, uh, North America that came down over Madison, actually, um, which was, which was um, unprecedented in some parts of Canada. It's not unprecedented for Canada to burn, but um, more and more of these events seem to be occurring. And actually, after I left as well, um, Greenland started caught on fire. So there was actually a fire in Greenland um, in the tundra. And uh, there have been fires before, but they're very rare. But this fire, uh, it was warm enough in Greenland for these fires to burn, actually, for a long time. There's enough carbon in the soil for it just to keep burning. So these fires, uh, the smoke gets transported to Greenland and then gets bound up in the snow. Okay, so that was actually what we were looking for on this trip. These are some of the sites I've been involved, in, involved uh, I've been working on in the past, these uh, so-called ice core sites. So these are sites on the, this is the Greenland ice sheet. Um, these are sites where uh, I've been involved in uh, ice core records. So we're drilling down into the, into the ice sheet. Uh, the most recent one is this one here, Renland, uh, the Renland ice cap on the side of um, Greenland called Recap. These red ones, uh, I was on this this is, I was part of this drilling activity in 2000 as part of a NASA project where we were drilling these um, ice cores to mainly to, to look at um, radar signatures from the ice and to go down into the ice and try and get dates for layers that NASA and other folks could find in the ice sheet. They'd fly over with aircraft and, or along the ground with the radar and they'd have these uh, lines in the ice that's somehow related to the chemistry that we find in, in the ice cores. And by dating the ice cores, we're allowed to, uh, we created a, net, a network of ice cores that you could uh, translate the radar signature into a, a chronological sequence. Um, 
And so I was involved in these, in these, all these re records, and and late, more more recently in this one, in one from Devon Island here as well. But one of the things I did, I realised um, after I developed this black carbon method, was that there is a lot of spatial variability from site to site. There's a it tends to be a very um, uh, uniform trend in some of these records, but there's events will happen where fire or smoke from somewhere will, will impact one site and not another. And so we're trying to get a snapshot of the um, snow surface during this trip. If you look at the, the relief of Greenland, you can see here too that there's, this is an exaggerated topography of Greenland, if you like. You can see that these, site, these ice core sites are on different sides of the, of the uh, ice sheet. And... Um, the topography affects the transport of chemistry to these sites. The other thing I'll point out too is this, this one, this is an ice core site I've just become involved in, East Scrip. And um, this site is on a river of ice. Um, you can see on this relief, it looks like there's, a, there's actually a groove in the ice. Actually, at one point you could see that when we're going down the ice. Um, and this is, this is a really important site that uh, there's a big international project working on right now and the reason is that it's, the ice speeds up as it comes, comes down towards the coast and there's a, a high velocity sort of ice stream which is important for ice, the ice, the balance or the ejection of ice from the ice sheet. This is kind of a, this is a recent, some recent work as well. So. This is the bed topography of Greenland. So if you were to take away the ice sheet, one day, one day in the future, let's, maybe it's 10,000 years, but in the future, if the ice sheet melts completely, this is what Greenland will look like. Uh, there'll be, uh, there'll be seawater in the middle of it, um, which is fairly cool. But there's, so there, there are canyons also that have been recently discovered up this north end. So when this finally disappears, it'll be a really spectacular country um, where the ice sheet used to be. Yeah, but so some of it's below sea level. That's, ten, yeah, 10,000 years maybe. Um, but we know, we know from the last warm period that there was some ice still. Um, the last warm interglacial warm period, the Emian, around 120,000 years ago, there was ice still on, uh, some ice still on, on Greenland. It was slightly warmer for a brief period than today. Um, but we're projected to go way beyond that this time. And if you, if you um, then put the ice back on, if you take away the bed, you have the, the actual ice thickness. And so the ice in Greenland is, um, it's over 3,000 metres. I'm trying to think in your logical units into feet. Um, it's over 10,000 feet at, at the summit. Okay, so the... Um, this is the ice sheet now, if you were to take that cross section. So this is what I was talking about where if you drill an ice core, this is a place called Camp Sentry, if you drill an ice core down here and another ice core here and another ice core here, and then you fly over this, over the ice sheet for radar, then you can see these, these uh, radar return lines. And some of these lines are from things like volcanic um, eruptions that have um, put, made the ice more acidic and it's affecting the radar return. But there's these constant lines, these lines of um, common age, if you will. So it's like a tree ring. Once, once you have the dating from the ice cores and um, the radar return, the, the ice sheet starts to become like a big tree ring, like a big onion or a tree ring. So you can go down into the ice sheet now with a, from a three-dimensional way and, uh, and know something about the age. And that also, if you know something about the age and the, the mass and then the, the velocity of the ice uh, as it's coming off, then you can tell a lot about its dynamics. And this is what an ice core looks like. I'm not going to go into the whole drilling and everything else, but the, um, uh, Madison has been um, a part of the ice core drilling uh, for many, many years. In fact, uh, um, right at the very beginning of it. But this is a colleague holding up a piece of ice. Um, this is a shallow from a shallow core. But this is, what you, this is basically what we're working on, but many, many, many kilometres of this ice. Okay, so can take, um, these projects can take 10 years to plan, 
and then 10 years to, do, to or 10 years to drill in some cases, and then you know, so many years to analyze them. So they're very long-term projects. The other thing I'd say about Green Greenland too, there's a lot of debate about um, you know, is, is Green Greenland melting down or not melting down? And we have, there's a lot of evidence um, for the, the, the current rate of melt. This is the GRACE satellite. I don't know if you know about the satellite, but there's these fantastic satellites that NASA has uh, that are orbiting the Earth, and they're connected by a laser beam. And these satellites are basically um, slowing down and speeding up due to gravity. And so they're measuring the Earth's gravitational field and over a point. And so from that, um, we have this record now of the gravitational field of the Greenland ice sheet. And we can see the ice uh, coming off Greenland uh, on, a, on a fairly, you know, on a, inter, on a seasonal basis. And so this is from, um, this is ending now in, uh, see, it's from, it's from 2000. Yeah, it's in 2012. But, but this, this part, this is 2012 here. And so you can see the ice coming, the seasonal change in the ice, off on, off on. And so it's coming back because of snowfall. So there's a melt season. Um, ice, there's icebergs carving off the coast, and there's a bit of a melt. And then there's snow coming back onto the ice sheet. So the mass, there's, there's a um, return of mass. But in 2012, there was this really dramatic drop and I think over this period here, the um, ice mass loss tripled. Um, 2012 was this really anomalous warm year. And a part of what happened, though, was that the, um, the snow didn't really come back on. The, the ice mass from the snow didn't really you know, come bounce back. And that was partly because um, there was a, a large, it was an anomalously warm year, and... The, the snow on the surface, the melt, the melt rate of the snow on the surface um, increased, the melt increased, and there were rivers of water coming off the ice sheet, and so a lot of that snow didn't come back on. Um, so a part of that, a part of the studies that came after that were to look at, well, okay, why is the snow melting on, what, what, are, what are the parameters that affect the snow melt on the surface? And temperature is the obvious one, but also... Um, the uh, reflectivity of the ice, the albedo of the ice, how reflective is it? And the things that I've been studying, black carbon, actually affect that. They affect the surface albedo, as, do, as does dust and um, life, actually. There's, algal, there's algae bloom starting in the, in, on the edge of the ice now, and they, they can be this vivid purple colour, so absorbing sunlight, so they're speeding up the actual melt. Uh, but the, the point here, I guess, is that... It, the, there is no debate about Greenland losing mass. It's losing its gravitational field. It's losing mass. Okay, so and this is kind of where we're at now. Um, I think the last, the current annual rate of uh, mass loss is something like, I think it's 456 gigatons. Um, and it, it seems to be accelerating, uh, although it may have slowed down in recent times. And so that's about... Um, on average, it's about 0.03 of this whole time series, about 0.03 inches sea level rise, but um, that's over the whole, this whole record. At the moment, I think Greenland's contributing about, at most, probably 25% of sea level rise at the moment. Yeah, that's one of the upper estimates. So it's quite, sea level rise, I think, is at the moment somewhere nearly up to three millimetres a year going up. Once upon a time, people looked at that thinking, well, it's not in my lifetime, but now... Now we're starting to feel sea level in our lifetime. And this is just what I was talking about there. This, um, this, is, this, this, uh, this is from a, a science um, paper, but my here. this is what I was talking about, about the melt, though. This is at the edge. So there's all these complicated things happening on the edge of the ice sheet uh, with melt water coming off, uh, with darkening of, of the ice from soot and dust, and, and then also um, life. And so... This is typical uh, of any ice body, really, but it's creeping up. And as it goes up, the, um, the melt rate is increasing. So the other, the other thing I was going to say, though, is that this, um, this, this whole thing that I got involved in uh, really 
a part of it was because when I did this NASA project as well, we were flying around in aircraft and we were diesel and the smoke everywhere, and it didn't, in some ways, it didn't really feel right because we're, you know, we're trying to do this um, environmental, we're looking at this um, uh, environmental records and thinking, wow, man, we need to, we need to change um, emissions and all these things, and yet here, here, here we were emitting all this fossil fuel. Um, and so there's been a lot of debate about this in, in um, academic circles about how we can um, improve our, our, our carbon footprint, uh, etc. And people have talked about going, going to less conferences and things like that. Um, but um, what we were really thinking of is trying to take it to a next, the next level and see if we could actually do this without, uh, you know, not, not, we, we still need to go out in the field, we still need to travel around the world to do our work, but could we, could we do it without fossil fuel? And so this is the Inuit, this is the sled, this is the Inuit wind sled that we, um, we, we, we took. So, so it's, it's, it's insane, right? If you looked, at, <laughs> when, I, when I saw this, when I first saw this, um, this actually look, looks more impressive, it looks kind of like a spaceship. Um, I thought, wow, okay. Um, and some, one of my colleagues actually approached, approached me at a bar in Copenhagen with this idea, and I thought, yeah, I think it could work. Um, uh, and so this is the concept. You, had a, you have a, a multiple sled um, system with a tent at the back for sleeping, some uh, food and other gear in this, in this next compartment, solar panels on these, and then this, this was to be the science module. And um, so we store ice core samples or snow samples and things like that in this, in this section. And then this is the piloting tent. And so the idea was that we'd have this massive kite 350 meters away from the, the sled. And um, that would pull us across the ice sheet. We would rotate in shifts. So some people would be, there's no sleeping on this, the wind sled, it's a resting. Some people would be resting, <laughs> okay, resting in the back. Uh, and then some people would be, would be piloting, someone else might be making water. And then we'd just rotate and basically uh, you might climb, climb across these and someone would climb back. Um, so in theory it seemed like it, it was possible. Um, the, uh, the concerns that I had, well, I had some concerns. <laughs> the concerns that I had originally was that actually wasn't the things I should have been concerned about. Uh, was about power. I was thinking, what, what's, what kind of science could we do on this? And really, could we generate enough electricity from solar panels? And uh, what was the kind of, what were the accelerations that we would experience in the sled? How rough would it be? Uh, I actually did a lot of training, a lot of work to put muscle on my back before this trip because I realized that I'd be punched, punched in the back about a million times, actually. <laughs> the undulations of the ice and the, the length, like you'd figure out how many times you're going to get smacked in the back. Um, so anyway, this is, this is the concept, and I um, hadn't, seen, hadn't, hadn't really seen the actual air, the craft itself, and this was the actual plan, this is the plan for our traverse. We'd start off down here near Kangalutuak, and um, uh, we would make our way up into the ice, um, and then we'd sample a few sites uh, along this side of the um, ice divide, and then a whole bunch of uh, high you know, closely sites close together down towards this new site, this um, east grip. And so this was at least the concept. Um, and so uh, and the, the other thing was that some of my colleagues that I thought were actually going on the trip sort of took a step back. <laughs> and was, in the end, I think I was the last, I was the, the last scientist standing. Um, anyway, so this is the, oops, if I can, sorry, this should kick in. OK, but lucky it'll just start up. There we go. So this is, Kangaloo, this is going to take us down, for, this is Google Earth. It's going to take us down to Kangalooziwak, where we started. Um, this is the main airport, the main hub of Greenland. This is also the, this is the Kangalooziwak Sound or the fjord. It's one of the longest fjords. And um, 
This is down now to this. This is uh, Sonderstrom. This is a U.S. Um, uh, military um, air force base, I guess we would call it. And now this is the ice. And you can see this zone here. This is the danger zone. <laughs> this is so there's a death zone between Kangalooziwak, where we we started out, and where we needed to get to. And this is our traverse route. And so the first, there's several. Um, let me get past this. Several, several. Um, what I'm trying to say is there's several stages to this trip. And this is the first part, though. This is the part that worried me probably the most. I think was uh, this is the, the the crevasse zone near just just on the ice edge. And so, in order to begin this journey, we had to get over this uh, death zone. So just cracks, crevasses everywhere, and then melt pools. And the, one of the concerns was that if we didn't get into this uh, trip early enough, we would, um, would there'd be melt. And then, actually, then we'd have a real problem. Um, a previous attempt to do one of these trips by, by, by the uh, Winslab crew, uh, they were very lucky because they didn't know it, but they, were, they started off going over a freshly frozen pond. <laughs> so imagine on the ice, there's a lake on the ice, and it's just below you, and you can't see it. And then the lake's draining somewhere, and so and there's a little bit of snow over the top. So the, the season, we started off fairly early in the season, and then we actually went way further. We, went, we uh, managed to get a helicopter that would fly us to the beginning and to fly us far enough inland that we would miss the cracks and the, the death pools. <clears throat> and we were also concerned about polar bear. Um, you know, it's one of these things we, we, were, we were worried about polar bear. The, the chances were low, but um, they had, had to shoot a polar bear at this base that we ended up with, um, where, where we ended up the year before. And, and it wasn't... The, the story that people say is if a bear's gone that far up in the ice, it must be crazy and weak and something like that. And this bear wasn't any of those things. Um, and uh, so we, we were concerned, and uh, we did have a gun with us. Although we tested the gun, and I can tell you, it wasn't going to stop a polar bear. <laughs> <laughs> it would make a polar bear very upset. Um, so this is Kangalooziwak. So this, so the first, the first, first stage actually was to, was to set up the sled, and to repair the sled that had been stored away, uh, and so my job for the first week was actually restringing the sled and drilling holes in it and doing some retrofitting. Um, one of the things about Kangalooziwak is that once you're in Kangalooziwak, you can't get you can't get anything, <laughs> you can't get duct tape, you can't get nuts, you can't get bolts. Uh, these are my colleagues. This is uh, pulling the gear out of the, out of the uh, container, and we—I don't know if you can hear this. We rebuilt the uh, sled uh, out on the, the deck. When I saw the when I saw it here, I, this is when I, this is when I did have a, a feeling of dread. <laughs> I thought, "What is this? Uh, it doesn't look like much. It looks really primitive, and um, it looks really loosely roped together." And in reality, I didn't understand what I didn't understand some of the principles of these sleds. So the idea is that the, old, the Inuit, Inuit knowledge that was put into this sled is that it has to be a living. It's a living entity. It has to move. It has to move in all sorts of directions. If it doesn't, it will just snap apart. And it looks primitive, but actually, there's, there's some high tech rope involved. Some very high, strong rope. The actual Wooden beams look like just lumps of wood, but they've got um, they're laminated birch with uh, fiberglass and built into it. High density polyethylene. Um, it still looks a little a little iffy, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's going to go across the ice sheet. The other thing, the other thing though, is that um, so there's the flexibility of it, but the, the whole concept is that if every if something breaks, then we're going to be able to repair it. A front skidoo or some big piston bully or something like this. If it, if the engine breaks, that you, you're done. But in this case, we could fix everything. We could the whole thing could be ripped apart and we could put it back together. So this is uh, we we spent we spent like five 
five days at least doing all this. So it took a long time to really string it back together. Um, we're replacing bits of rope, um, etc. Actually, my hands were cut to pieces. This is another stupid thing I did. I didn't wear gloves. And so when I got on the ice, I could barely, could barely uh, move my fingers, just some tiny little slices. So, yeah, it's a, I would call this techno-primitive. That's what I think I would call it. It's subtly... There's technology in there, you just can't see it. Um, so food... Oops. Uh-oh. This could be bad. Slight intermission. Whilst I'm waiting for that to reboot, I will attempt to show you um, what it was like once it's actually running. If I can get this to go, and then I can try and get back to the... So hopefully I can get that to, to go back and, and uh, work again. But this is, this is actually what it looked like when it was assembled on the ice. And so this is a 3D image that I took that's actually now splayed out. And what you'll be able to see is up here is the kite. There's someone pulling, there's someone actually working the kite from the side. And then the, uh, I'm holding the actual camera. So, this is what it was actually like when it was going across the ice. Um, again, this is a three-dimensional, this is a complete image that's turned around. And uh, this, this sled now is it's over two and a half ton. Okay, so, yeah, it, it, was, a, it was almost like a, I call this a magical, this is a, a very surreal experience in the sense that you are... All you can hear is the crunching of the ice and someone playing some music. But you're pulling this kite in a figure eight kind of configuration. So you would pull it... If you want to go trying to head in, a, say, this direction, and the kite would be flying... You might fly over this way, turn it around in a figure eight, then catch the wind again. And so there's this constant pulling of the kite up and, up and around. But this kite is so far away, the kite is so far away that you're, um, you, know, you, can, you can sort of see it off in the distance. And the, the kite itself is about, I think the biggest kite, we had about uh, 10 kites, but the biggest one is, was about 80 metres uh, in surface area. Um, the, first, the first day when we landed on the ice, and hopefully I can get this thing to, to, keep, to go back and wake up again. Um, but the, 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 first, the first day that we got this we landed on the ice and we, um, we spent two days reassembling this sled it packed into a helicopter so it was, it was able to, we were able to build it out and then break it back down again and um, the uh, uh, once it, the first day we set it all up, and there's an emergency release on the kite. So there's two couple of things can happen. When you launch this kite, the um, if the kite if the whole thing takes off too fast, the wind picks up. You have this big kite. There's a there's a good chance you're never going to get down. Okay, and so the thing's going faster and faster and faster, and eventually this whole sled will be ripped apart. And you know if you can imagine. 
a two and a half ton thing just going. And so there's a pin, and the, the emergency release pin. And so the, um, the idea is that there's one person next to this pin, and another person is trying to, to sail. And the, the Spanish word is svelta, svelta, release, release. Uh, and at the first, the first time we, got to, we were going to launch this kite, I was next to this pin, and um, Ramon was yelling out, Schwelter, Schwelter, but to someone else about something else. And of course, I pulled the pin <laughs> <laughs> and, launched, and, and launched the kite. Um, the, uh, the, result, <laughs> the result of that was we were there for another two days. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm not feeling confident here. That this is going to relive, get back to itself. The um, like complete collapse. So the the um, once we did get the, the the kite going again, it was really the most magical feeling that you can imagine. Just cruising across, across the ice with uh, seemingly nothing pulling you because it's way off into the distance. The thing I didn't count on was that. Um, you get seasick. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, if you're not, if you weren't piloting the, the uh, if you weren't piloting the the sled, then you were resting slash sleeping, and inside the tent. So it was, you got down to minus thirty, um, or close to minus thirty, when the sun dipped down. The sun never set, but it did dip down. And then during the during the uh, peak, it could get up to. Let's say um, once or twice it got to minus two Celsius. It almost got to, to melting, actually. But typically it was minus 15 Celsius. And so you were in your sleeping bag, you're in the, um, in the, on, in the tent, but the undulations, so the, the, the sled would be, was actually moving in this kind of, kind of way, and then also this way, all at once. <laughs> and so the, the, bump, the bump profile on the, on the ice is you know, this. And so, yeah, so it started off like, I couldn't believe it, this is magical, this is great. And then, <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> and then I was sick. Um, feeling sick, but, and also being punched in the back. Um, and so, um, yeah, I lost a lot of weight. So, so during this, this there was the, we, were rash, we had uh, 40 days of rations with the idea that we would get across the ice sheet in 30 days, uh, or to the to east, to east Grip, 750 kilometres. Um, so we had plenty of food. But for me, at least, the, uh, the ration... I wasn't used to Spanish food. And so some of the rations were, uh, were lomo. Does anyone know lomo? So it's this really thick ham that's uh, paprika. And so I, was having, I had trouble digesting it. Uh, and I was seasick. A, lot of the, a good chunk of the time. Yeah, and um, so I lost about, let's see, I lost about, uh, I'm trying to think, 20 pounds or more. I completely shriveled up. Um, and then also, also for, most, for, lo- for a large amount of the, um, the trip, we were above uh, 9,000 feet. So for a good chunk of it, we were at 9,000 and 10,000 feet. And so we had elevation and in, in Greenland, uh, 10,000 feet feels like 15, just because of the low air pressure. And so uh, all of us were suffering from that as well. Um, and so the, the big problem was just your body shutting down as well. Um, when we got to stop, there's, the quest, there's a couple of questions that people use that will ask. And one is, um, how do you go to the bathroom if the, if the sled is always moving? <laughs> So, so that was one of the difficulties, actually. One of the difficulties of this trip was, was basically uh, when we, you know, the, the time that you had to stop to go to the bathroom, which was basically just running off and digging a hole, and then um, being able to do that in sequence without, with the moving. When, when, we were, um, when we were out of sight, the way we would stop the sled if we could, was to... So if, if you think about the way that these, the kite would work, the angle of the, um, the kite versus the, the motion that, or the direction that we were going at, there's a, if you bring this, the sled up 
really, really high, then the, eventually the force forward um, is diminished and the sled would just stop. And so the way we did some of the sampling was that the, um, the, someone would hold the sled, hold the kite, um, so that it was just flying just, just above. And then I'd, I'd basically have, have to jump out and dig a hole as fast as humanly possible because the person would still be <laughs> driving this... Driving the uh, taking a sample or leaving a sample? <laughs> <laughs> taking it. <laughs> yeah, if you dig that pit, you get to use it. <laughs> but um, yeah, so so uh, I think yeah, so basically what I was doing is um, I would I would get out, I would uh, drag my gear out, put on a clean suit like a white suit so I didn't contaminate the samples. <coughs> And then the goal for my black carbon samples was to just take the top 20 centimetres. Um, the reason for that was that that's the, the, the depth, I guess, that the light is penetrating into the snow, um, snowpack and, and really interacting with the, the soot, the little black um, smoke that would be in the surface layers. And so I was coming to this, this I was approaching this, the site from uh, downwind, putting on a suit, and then I had a few tools that I could measure down, say, five centimetres into the surface of the snow. And then I had a, a clean tube, which then I was, um, I was extracting that five centimetres of snow. So I was taking, doing duplicates uh, of each step and then down um, to 20 centimetres at each site. So I'd carefully do that. And then I would dig like crazy. Um, so I was digging... Uh, two metre pits, two and a half metre pits at some, some sites and then taking a long uh, tube made of carbon fibre and just pushing that gently vertically down on the side of the pit and then trying to extract it out through the pit wall and those tubes are um, basically a, a depth profile of the, of the snow which then um, we could take back to the lab in uh, Copenhagen to analyze in very high detail, high you know, one centimeter depth profile along the tube. Um, so I was taking two meters of two, two of those tubes, one on top of the other, and then having to extract them out. So I was digging, some, some sites I think I dug a three meter pit, 25 minutes, that's my best, my best one. But um, I shovel. <laughs> I was digging like an impact crater. It was crazy. Uh, just because some poor person was having to hold, hold this thing. Um, and it did, get, it did get really cold, actually, when you, you were piloting the, the sled. The, um, once, we, once we got to the... Uh, I think midway, we got to, the, we got to the, um, the ice divide. So a lot of the time you're sort of going up, 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 up. And then you can actually see it. There's a slight... Uh, undulation in the snow going up and then we reach the ice divide and then you can actually feel it going down it's kind of crazy but mo part of it's an optical illusion I think but then we're going, we're going down and the, the sort of terminology was surfing the ice river down towards this um, to uh, East Grip um, the, the other thing I was going to say is we, we had some emergency procedures because <clears throat> The nice thing about the sled is that your tent already made. You don't have to pull out a tent in an emergency. Um, and so the tent's there. But there are these um, storms that come up over the ice sheet, uh, Arctic hurricanes. And um, when I was on the ice sheet previously, the, what, we had some of these events. And uh, we almost lost a huge dome blowing away at 100 mile an hour winds, this kind of thing. And in this case, the, um, the procedure was that if we, we got, had a report that there was an Arctic hurricane coming up onto the ice sheet, we would brace the tent with storm poles, make enough water to survive for 24 hours, and then be in full gear in, in the tent. And then if the tent, we're well, holding the walls actually, if the tent collapsed, started to collapse, you would have to uh, grab hold of the, the walls of the tent and drag it in a, on yourselves and hold that for 24 hours. <laughs> and, um, 
then if the if the um, if the tent actually was ripped apart and bl blew away, then we had these uh, survival bags that were strapped to the sled. Um, I actually tested one of these bags. <laughs> they wouldn't have worked. Uh, the, the problem was, the idea was you crawl inside the bag and then push the, the cargo up against the, the wind side to survive. Uh, and there'd be one person in each one of these body bags. <laughs> the problem though was that the, the zip, you, you needed to unzip the, uh, a part of it to breathe and um, the snow would have come in. And so you're trying to keep the snow in. And then if that failed, we were to, to dig under the sled and survive under the sled, which I think would have worked actually. The, um, the other thing we had with us, we had uh, Iridium um, uh, phones to communicate, which work, worked a, well, all right, I guess, occasionally. Um, and we had, but we had these uh, inReach Garmin, inReach Explorer um, GPS units, which you could text with. And actually, those things were the, your lifeline. So we had them strapped to our body the whole time. <coughs> Some, some of the folks here are actually following mine and they would have noticed that it stopped <laughs> and stayed still for a long time because I lost it over the side. One day I was flying, I was piloting. Um, luckily I found a, a, there was a reserve one there. But the, the, the idea of these uh, GPS units you had strapped to you was that if anything were to happen um, that you need to leave a sled, you could put down a waypoint and walk away and be able to find your way back. In that environment, where there's, there's completely white, there is no nothing. Uh, within, you can walk, if you walk 20 metres away from the sled, um, suddenly the wind can pick up and you get a surface snow drift, just blowing snow, and there's complete white out. And you can easily just walk off in the wrong direction. Um, and so one day I was resting and suddenly the, the sled did stop and um, it was just dead quiet. What's going on? And I got up and I realised I was completely alone. <laughs> I was completely alone on this sled. And uh, I went up to the front and um, it was a bit hazy. And there was some footprint walking off into the distance. And uh, I realised what had happened was that they, sh they should have told me. But they had to release the kite. And they were chasing it. <laughs> and they were gone. And uh, I actually, and this is something I probably I wouldn't do again, but... I grabbed some food, stuck it in my pocket, <laughs> laid a waypoint, <laughs> and took off. Yeah. Um, and the reason, probably the reason being, I probably should have stayed there, but I, I did catch up with them when we came back. But the reason is, I mean, the, one of the hardest challenges of this kind of trip is actually inside your head. Um, it was physically pretty grueling, at least for me. I shriveled a little, shriveled up, everything else. But, but really, it was more the mental side of it. And you kind of, you know, in a uh, groove where you are just, um, you're sort of in a lockdown mode thinking, okay, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do the next thing, um, trying to, you know, do everything so you're going to survive. Uh, but when there's an interruption like that, you don't want to be by yourself. <laughs> and so, um, anyway, so that, that was just one of the stories. At, at night time as well, we were sleeping in double bags and we just, we just have a slight breathing hole. And so sometimes, once or twice, I think my breathing hole blocked up in the middle of the night, you're sort of like, <gasps> <laughs> um, So, uh, you know, eventually we, we did make it down to, and I really apologise, this whole thing has died, but we, we made it down to um, this eScript site, and you should, if you've got, if you've got any curiosity, um, you can look up, just type in eScript ice core, and it'll take you to the homepage. And so my colleagues at... Um, the uh, University of Copenhagen are leading this. It's a big international project which the US is involved in, as are many, many countries. And this, um, this site, there are, there's a whole underground complex, under ice, I should say, complex at this site, where they've made tunnels under the ice to set up, or oh, most of the drilling is actually happening under, under, in this underground warren of tunnels. And um, up top there is a dome, which is uh, for eating that kind of thing. Um, but this this ice project, this project is going to be going on for the next, uh, I think, next five years. And um, I, I'm uh, next week going to a meeting there to uh, to join this, and to go back and um, 
to, swear, to unpack the sled, um, but to, um, to do more of this work around the, this site, perhaps with the sled, we're not sure yet, but the, uh, the, there's going to be a long, long-term study uh, of doing this black carbon work um, at satellite sites from this area. The, the longer term, this um, ice core project should go down to bedrock at this site, um, and which will take the record, will probably go back uh, more than 50,000 years at this site. But what they're really after at this site is to do with the ice dynamics, the, how fast is this ice stream, this ice streaming out of um, uh, Greenland, and what was the history of that. And so that's really important for determining how stable the ice sheet is, actually. So some of the um, images I showed you were, were of the um, grace data for ice, the ice that's being lost from Greenland. The question is, is that going to speed up in the future? So most of these processes, I would say, are nonlinear. So there's very little in the Earth system that follows a straight line. Things speed up and slow down. And um, at the moment, in the Arctic, it does feel like it's, it's spinning up. Yep. Uh, and the future for the Arctic, with my work, is really to do with um, more fires in the Arctic and the tundra burning. And uh, I have a I'm working on a 120,000 year record from this Renland site on the side of, An of Greenland. And that does go back into the last warm period, this uh, Eemian period, which is sort of the analogue of today, the Holocene. The, the, this, glacial, this interglacial period that we're in now, at the end of that period there was a spike in temperature which maybe is a little bit warmer than it is today um, from just the dynamics of the, of the climate system. But in, the, in the, the fire record that I see, it suggests that there was actually more burning then than, than today. And so the, expect, the only way I, could, I can conceive that we could see that in the record is if the tundra was burning just the, the grasslands of the Arctic caught fire. The difference today, though, is that as the sea ice diminishes in the Arctic, and especially the, the thickness of the sea ice, as the, as the ice gets thinner and thinner, which it has been, eventually there is a mass migration of ships through the Arctic. And, um, and also just, yeah, it's already started. The human population is uh, increasing in the Arctic, uh, on the Russian side, there is a lot more fossil fuel extraction going on now. And so the soot particles that I've been interested in are actually previously coming into the, coming into the Arctic from long-range atmospheric transport is now being produced in the Arctic close by. Um, and so the expectation, though, is that the, from now on we're going to see more and more shipping through the Arctic. And uh, I think this year there was a, a Russian oil tanker that sailed through the Arctic with a, a slight a strengthened hull. The, they'd built a strengthened um, hull for the ship, so they didn't need heavy icebreakers to make a channel for the, for the ship. So every year from now on, most likely we're going to see more and more ship traffic. And eventually it becomes like a big highway. Um, and then all the things that come with that, garbage and, and emissions. So I think from now on, at least for this uh, soot, we're going to have more fires, uh, not every year, that's not how things generally work, but generally speaking, there'll be more fires in the boreal forests. The uh, Arctic tundra is probably going to burn more and more, and then there'll be uh, intense shipping through the Arctic. So we're on, the, we're on the cusp of a new kind of pollution era, I think, in the Arctic. Um, and so the goal for us is to, um, uh, to investigate that and then uh, relay our findings to policymakers. There are a serious policy um, policies of being of, of international engagement in this area for em ship emissions in the Arctic that are ongoing right now. So I really apologise for the uh, <laughs> collapse <laughs> collapse of the, um, the system. I think if we've got time I might time? Yes. Did uh, you see much difference between the samples you took on the sled and the samples you previously took 
Difference in those so, so the, the question was, um, did I see any difference in the samples that we collected from the sled compared to what we did previously with, with dirtier techniques? And the answer to that is, um, uh, I'll be able to tell you in a month. The um, I haven't. Uh, we bring we're bringing the samples back uh, next week, end of next week, back to um, the University of Wisconsin to start the analysis. They they stayed at the end site and have gone in. Um, one thing I would say, though, that is that I, I, um, I expect they'll be cleaner. They better be. But, but the actual, the site, the actual um, East Grip site itself, we took some samples from there. I think that place is completely contaminated with, with carbon, with black carbon. The biggest job that we had was making water. That, that's exactly what we're doing all the time. And this actually is where we did use some fossil, we had to use a little bit of fossil fuel for that. We did have a little gas burner to, um, to melt water. Uh, one of the things that I was doing on that trip though was I was trying to make solar water. So I, I was, my own water, I, was, I had a special bag and I was testing to see if we could actually melt that with the sun. And uh, actually that was pretty successful. So um, the, the design challenge for some of the future trips that they intend to do is to build solar Tubes in insulated sort of see-through glass to, to melt water that way. Right, yep. would, would you comment on the, the impact of volcanic activity on the ecosystem you're studying? Yeah. So the the, quest, the question is, um, uh, what's the impact of um, volcanic activity on the on the <coughs> ecosystem we're studying? Um, so in the past, there's been um, some some large volcanic eruptions, and so some of those eruptions are local, from from uh, mainly from Iceland. And, uh, but some of, the, some of these um, volcanic eruptions are global events. And, and for the ice core studies, these uh, volcanic eruptions are important for basically having a, a, a dating marker. This is common that we can find everywhere in the world. But what, what the uh, volcanic eruptions do do, the, the really big, large volcanic eruptions, uh, um, they cool the earth. The sulfate, uh, sulfuric acid turns to sulfate particles, scatters light. So it reflects light back into space. And so there are some, some uh, cool, cooling events from these volcanic eruptions. And one of the things that we're, uh, at least I've been interested in with the fire record is that do we, do we see a less fire after one of these um, events just because the Earth itself is getting cooler? Um, so far, from that, at least from that perspective, the, um, we do know that the, the Earth does cool down after these big eruptions, but the fire record it's complicated because the actual sulfuric acid particles that are emitted by the volcanic eruptions, um, they reduce the lifetime of the soot in the atmosphere. <laughs> so they coat the, they coat the, um, the particles and uh, allow them to interact with clouds more efficiently. So they get extracted out faster. So the question, if you look at the record and you see a dip in this stuff, do you say, uh, do you, is it because there was less fire or just because the sulfuric acid actually extracted the stuff faster? Is it uh, possible to chemically analyze the soot particles to determine what was burning to create the soot? Yes, that's a fantastic question. So the, um, the question is, is it possible to apportion the, the, um, the black carbon soot to some source, whether it be uh, certain plants or um, fossil fuel? And this is exactly the direction that we've been, we've been working on um, or, or heading. So there's, there's several things that we've tried so far to do this, and one is to just um, look at traces of different things. Um, we had a paper in Science in 2007 where um, we, had a, we had a record of black carbon. This is just told us that something burnt. And then we had um, vanillic acid as well. And vanillic acid, uh, at least in the, in the Arctic, is largely coming from conifer fires. So the boreal forest, the, the trees. So you can actually see that some of these um, events in the record are connected to, to uh, conifer fires, uh, and then some aren't. And some are connected to sulfuric acid from coal. So we, have a, we can see the coal record is um, differentiated from the, the plant. What we hope to do in the future, though, is to be able to um, get enough of this soot, purify it, um, and then 
analyze it for uh, carbon isotopes. So um, from that, we'll be able to tell whether at least some proportion of it is coming from fossil fuel, probably in the Arctic, um, or is some of it coming from uh, grass, or is some of it coming from um, trees. But that's, a, that's a future study. It requires, uh, let's see, requires a lot of water actually concentrated down. We need at least, I mean, probably 12 micrograms of carbon um, to do an analysis for that. But the, the, the actual concentrations are part per billion, um, generally low part per billion, so we've got to get enough of it together. Uh, yep. Uh, you mentioned earlier that, that you were investigating new measurement tools. Um, where is that work being done? Um, well, the, the, the measurement, the tool that, that what, I, what I came up with um, was I repurposed uh, an instrument that was being used for uh, flying an aircraft um, and uh, doing some other studies to measure very small quantities of black carbon. And then I interfaced it with several other pieces of equipment to um, aerosolize, take, so basically to measure black carbon in water. Um, so the instrument itself was uh, is from Boulder, the, the, the actual spectrometer, and then I came up with the rest of it. But in this case, um, it spread out. And after I after I developed that the method for doing it in water, um, it spread out. Now that the whole bunch of groups are, are, are working on it now, um, and essentially what I was doing is uh, I was taking liquid water, so it's reversing the whole process. You imagine it. It's in, locked in snow and ice. Uh, it, it was came out of the air. So I'd take the, take the ice, melt it, spray it, and I'd take that spray and dry it out and then liberate the little bits of soot again into the into a airstream. Then I'd pass the soot through the heart of an intracavity laser um, where the little bits of soot could, could um, absorb enough energy to glow again. So it's just reversing it back. So now they're little glowing specks. It's complete, complete reversal. And this instrument was able to pick up the individual nanoparticles glowing and determine their temperature. And this black carbon soot refractory nanoparticles have a very uh, specific material property in that they could be heated up to nearly 4,000 Kelvin, or 4,000 degrees, say. So they'll, they'll go up to that really high temperature. Most things won't. Uh, nano diamonds might, might, for instance, or pure tungsten. Um, and then we were able to capture the individual flash little events and then turn that, turn that into a, a mass concentration. Um, there's, the method is pretty difficult. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a very complicated, it's a, the, the whole thing doesn't look that impressive, but the amount of data that pours out of it is you know, terabytes. It's, it's a huge um, thing, to, hard thing to work with. Um, the next development, though, is to uh, one of the things I do hope to do with this one of these records that I have is that uh, I have a my theory is that nano diamonds um, will actually be in that there'll be some nano diamonds in this ice, and nano diamonds should, in theory, uh, burn it burn up at a higher temperature. And because I've got each individual nanoparticle, I can measure and have basically measured their temperature. I'm going to sort through all these and look for a spike in nanodiamonds. And if I see that, it will tell us that there was some impactor. So there's a theory that a small asteroid or something hit the, the ice sheet um, around the time of uh, the younger Dryas um, and may have... I don't believe this theory, by the way. <laughs> but if it did, um, if, this is, if this is true, it might have, and there's this theory that it wiped out the, some of the Clovis people. If this is true... Um, and the big chunk of North America and, and the Arctic was sprayed with um, nano diamonds. They're not, we should see them in the ice, in the ice sheet. That's another this is a, a sort of sideline. Yes. Uh, at the very beginning, you were studying sand in water. Is that how you oh no, oh, dust. Dust. Yeah, yeah. In where? In water. Yeah, yeah. So um, most of what I've been doing really is water. Uh, so the question is, uh, at the beginning of this talk, I was um, talking about uh, starting off by Korea uh, analysing dust in, in, in the ocean. 
basically, this, this is part of a, a hypothesis called the iron, iron hypothesis, and it is that the uh, plankton in the southern ocean um, unab unable to consume all the available nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus, because of a limitation of iron. There's low iron concentrations in the surface waters. But during some events in the past, dust, increased desert dust, blowing down into the uh, southern ocean, um, landing on the surface, may have increased phytoplankton um, production, sucking down, causing a drawdown in carbon dioxide into the ocean. As the, as, these, as the plankton bloom. And so what I was looking at is, the one is measuring the amount coming down from the atmosphere into the southern ocean, onto sea ice actually, and then how bioavailable is it? How, just because it's a bit of chunk of dust with iron in it, can the plankton uh, consume it and then increase their, pro their primary productivity? Um, the problem is that most of this dust is very insoluble. The iron in it's not very soluble. But we, we found that the, there is some kind of, um, as you get lower concentrations, it becomes more soluble. And um, at least as far as I can figure out, it's to do with um, oxalic acid in the atmosphere, which is coming from fire. And the oxalic acid is sort of digesting it slightly, extracting it. Uh, yes? You uh, took those three meter cores. It was all snow. Yeah. It was it was fern. Yeah, it's 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 like polystyrene at that point. It's kind of a yeah. Down there's some little ice layers in there. Um, in fact, there's this 2012 melt layer that we're trying to bust through a thick, thick thick chunk of ice at that point. So yeah. So does that go back a few years or many years? That's a that's a good question. So the um, the, the question with with these snow tubes that we pushed into the into the snowpack is how. Uh, how much time did they integrate? And actually it varies from site to site. So uh, as we went up over the ice sheet, actually the, the snow accumulation, uh, the amount of snow falling every year is, is actually diminishing. And so those tubes are actually going back further and further. Um, at the beginning, I would say they're probably going back uh, 10 years. Um, well, sorry, not 10 years, maybe five years. But at, near the end of this trip, they were going back at least uh, 10 years. These were just so. These, this was just sort of to um, uh, it's an ongoing study where they're tra traversing along the same line and, and trying to um, capture the same similar bits of, of the snowpack. Uh, yes. It looked to me like the wind was coming out of the south <coughs> west. What happens when it comes from a different direction? Yeah. So that's a great question. So the, one, the question is. Um, <laughs> When the wind changes, how, how the heck are you sailing across the ice? <laughs> That's a, a, that, 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 is, that is the dilemma. And so, um, yeah, so this, one of the difficulties of sailing across the ice, so obviously uh, made it out that we just took off and that was it. No, 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 no. Um, there was, it, was a, it, was a, it was like a, 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 a fight across the ice. I think in Spanish they were saying a lucha. It was a mucha, mucha lucha. Um, <laughs> And so the, there's, we're tacking against, most of the time we're actually, the, the wind was going certain, sub, at least for the good chunk of this trip, we had the wind with us to some degree. If it completely inverted, we wouldn't be able to, we'd, have to, we'd just stop and have to wait it out for a couple of days probably. The, the other thing though, the interesting thing to me though was that um, the, the wind, just because the wind was going one direction uh, up high didn't mean it was going one direct, the same direction down below. And in fact, um, many days we were riding catabatic winds, and so if the kite went up too high, the wind would throw you around. But if you came during during the um, at least uh, say 10 o'clock in the morning, um, then the cold air would start coming down slope, and then you catch this really close to the ground air. Um, so the, the, we were able to ride catabatic winds uh, for a good chunk of the trip, actually. Who holds the kite up to get it going? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's okay. The runner. That's the job of the runner. I, I got my license. I had to pilot. Let's see. I had to do um, fly the kite. Had to do. I had to build the sled. Uh, the runner. I, they 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 let, let me off easy on the runner though. So the runner. The job of the runner is to, to run out 350 meters. Uh, you unfold the kite in a very specific way, and then you have to hold the nose up of the kite. And this thing, will, it's, it's, quite a, it's a little bit scary because once if the winds, there's enough wind and you hold that nose up, up it goes, then you have to run because if you get caught up in the lines, <laughs> a 
to go. And then you have to catch the sled. <laughs> you have to catch the sled. It's got, well, yeah, actually, that's what I thought originally, but you have to, actually, you, you have to be smart about it and sort of run sideways, then, then jump on. Yeah. Uh, yes. I was about your, the weather patterns in the world and what, in your research now. What do you try to combine those two? Yeah, so the, um, the question is, how do you combine your research with um, what's known about climatology and the, and the weather? Um, so this is, a, this is really, we're just one part of... Uh, a whole global network of, of researchers studying the, the Earth system. And so I'm working closely with um, people who are modelling the, the um, atmospheric circulation uh, in connection to, say, the combust burning. And their biggest problem is that the, they, the climate system is very actually sensitive to these black carbon soot because it, not just on the snowpack would make darkening the snow, but in the atmosphere it uh, warms the atmosphere at some layer and, and changes circulation. Um, air circulation and so their biggest problem is that um, one there's no history right so we're trying to go backwards in time and, and to figure out how sensitive the earth's climate has been to that as particles in the atmosphere in the past but but also that um, especially for this stuff the black carbon soot it, it's a uh, residence time in the atmosphere uh, changes due to uh, let's say, getting co coated with volcanic, a volcanic sulphate or just getting coated with sulphate from the atmosphere will change how long it lasts in the atmosphere. And so they're actually taking our data and then trying to validate their um, really complex circulation models with it. And then, and then we're also project, projecting out scenarios into the future. But there are some of these, some of these models are, um, uh, especially for this stuff, uh, still unconstrained. And so there, there's kind of a two-way thing going on. One is we're helping to provide, give them real data that they can work with. And then on the other hand, we're, we're, trying, we're interested in where the stuff's coming from. Uh, yes? Uh, this university is famous for the ice cube experiment down in Antarctica. Have you looked at any of those samples to see whether they have anything to say? Um, so the, the question is, uh, the University of um, Wisconsin-Madison is, is heavily involved in the uh, Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory at the South Pole, and uh, have, I, have I been involved in any of those ice core samples? Uh, no, I haven't. They, um, uh, I'm very interested in the detector. There is a, a, a different... There has been an ice core project, though, near, next, near um, the Ice Cube, uh, the South Pole Ice Core, and some colleagues uh, are working on that at the moment, but I haven't been involved in that one. Yes. Is there enough structure in that uh, habitation tent to rig hammocks, which would take care of a lot? <laughs> <laughs> so the question, the question is, uh, could we rig hammocks in the uh, the habitation in the, the sleeping uh, tent? Um, I wish that were true, but no, no. It's um, the motion. There was a video in there of the crash, the, burnt, the crash of the rest of it, but the the video showed the motion, and the motion was too intense. And the, the um, yeah, it's too, it's too much going on. Uh, there would be, I think it would be worse to be a hammock. The, um, and then also the, the way that the, the tent is, the tent, the structure is, it has to move. It's just, a, just the, the nature of the whole, the whole thing is it has to be able to move really freely. And so if you're um, tied onto it, you probably break the tent, I think. The thing I didn't, didn't say too is that the, the, um, these guys have been, the Spanish wind sled team has been sp um, funded by the Prince of Monaco to undertake the longest ever unsupported traverse of Antarctica, um, 2017, 2018. And so they're basically going, I want to say four months or longer, around this great, this sort of grand tour around uh, Antarctica on this, this thing. Um, slightly updated version. Um, I'm involved in uh, consulting with them about um, properly powering it. The, the, the other thing I was going to say with this, with this trip, one of my, my duties was to evaluate the, electric, the electrical system and the solar panels and things like that. And um, that was not done right <laughs> this, this time. Um, but the, for the next time, there, it will be, uh, there should be a lot of electrical power. The, the, solar power, the solar power up there was incredible. There was so much solar power. This is the thing I didn't, didn't appreciate either, that 
we had these little fold up panels that you could fold up and stick in the backpack that would generate you know, 150 watts. And there was so much sunlight up there, and plus the things, were, they work better when they're cold, that um, they were dangerous. They were seriously dangerous. Things were exploding. Um, mushroom cloud type explosion in my hand, <laughs> on, catching on fire and throwing it out of the tent. Um, which really, really, really makes you think back to this greening of science, though. It's like, um, you know, the solar, solar power has come so far now that it's, it's, we don't, in some ways, the whole coal thing is over. It's not economical. These things are going to outpace anything very soon. Um, but we have, to be out, we have to be incorporating that into our research, I think, we, and our, our academic institutions. We can't be, um, there's no need anymore. I, th I think the, the sense of that is we can really, we can really do renewable now in a cost-effective way. Um, and this kind of research too, you could, you could easily conceive of a solar-powered um, skidoo, for instance. Can you talk some more about that, the effect of the altitude? I mean, that's, you're very far north. Yeah. The insulation, um, very far north, but the sun didn't set. The sun didn't. The sun wasn't setting, and that the high, your, the higher altitude as well, and then the scattering. So because you, the whole surface, that whole place is just, the sunlight was. I had I had a I had sunscreen, intense sunscreen on the whole time, and um, I had goggles, and I was my eyes were still being burnt out, and I had to stick um, polarized filters to have a picture of. Reversing the polarization stuck on my head because my eyes were burning out, and um, all this. Uh, my colleague um, JJ, who's a Greenlander, the first day up on the ice, I offered him my sunscreen, and he said, "Nah, look, we don't. I don't need sunscreen." Two days later, he had blood pouring off his face because he was. The sun was just insane. Yeah, and oh yeah, yeah, and the. Um, the, uh, so the altitude and just the bouncing of the light. Um, with the solar panels, though, they, I think they work more efficiently when they're cold. And these solar panels were, they were a real health hazard. I mean, you, you had a real, you had a real risk of uh, electrocution with these things. Yeah, you're serious. The, other, the, only, the only last little story I'll, I'll, I'll um, give to you, though, as well, is that... <coughs> If you looked at this whole thing, you know, like I said, at the very beginning, I had a real sense of dread in my stomach when I looked at the thing. I thought, "Oh no, we could die. Um, we could die." But the thing was, it was all under our control. You know, everything except maybe falling down a crack, but or a polar bear. But it was all under our control, and like we weren't moving. We were moving fast enough, but not super fast. So, like a skidoo, there's a lot of skidoo accidents where people just fire off and then. You know, crush their rib cage and things like that. So we had no high velocity issues. Um, we could repair everything, um, and so that was we could you could get frostbite um, going to the bathroom. <laughs> but one of us nearly did die on this trip. And um, uh, Nacho, one night, ironically, we had these Inuit survival biscuits. Right, so these biscuits will last ten years. These big thick biscuits. Uh, uh, crackers, let's call them crackers. And one night um, we were just lying there, sort of exhausted after dinner, and uh, Nacho all of a sudden made this awful noise. And he, in that tent, just four or five of us in that tent, he left, he hit the roof of the tent and um, just landed on his stomach. And uh, I thought he was throwing up, I'm like, oh, get him quick, give him a bag or something. And he was choking to death on an Inuit survival biscuit. And he'd, he'd been out already two minutes or more there. And he was, that was his last, he, for some reason he didn't go like this or do anything. But for some... Was that, that the northernmost uh, self-inflicted <laughs> It was. It was impressive. And it did, it spat right out. But um, that was his last, last card to play. And we, we didn't realise. So after that we were all very, are you okay? Are you okay? Are you okay? <laughs> but before that, yeah. Yeah, it would have been, uh, and the ir irony of it being it was a survival biscuit. <laughs> yeah, so. A couple more questions. Yes. Uh, can I ask you one more question about the architect uh, team that designed this sled? 
Yes. Um, you said the Inuits had some, that was a genius move, I suspect, but who, who were the architects of that? So um, the question is, who was the architects of this sled, and, um, and what was the history behind it? And, and it was Ramon. Actually, the, the architect of this um, Inuit wind sled is this guy, Ramon Laramendi. Um, having said that, he, he took the idea off uh, Inuit sleds. Um, so he spent a lot of time crossing the Arctic um, with dogs and, and kayaks and things like that and, and, and living with uh, Inuit people. And he was taking the sort of the lessons that they have for doing just about everything. And one is it has to be super simple. Um, and, um, and so, for instance, the sleds, the sleds are, have um, you know, leather and, and sinews and things holding them together. But the real the rationale is that everything can move. And just so if you're bashing against really hard things all day, um, anything that's stiff will break. And, and it was basically that. And the, he's realized when he walked to the North Pole, it sounded awful, like an awful, awful experience. And he was thinking all along, yeah, man, if the wind could pull me along, it'd be great. And so it, it didn't just, it took him a long time. It's over a long period of time that he started playing with kites and, and putting this thing together. The other thing I would say too is that, um, you know, the, the one, one issue with this, this uh, mode of transport, you need some real experts to drive it. There's no just somewhat novice jumping on and, and doing it. So, and so the, the, there's only a few people with that experience, I think. Mm -hmm. wow. Is there a film being made? There's a film being made, yes. Um, there is actually a film being made. Um, there, there is some talk with uh, National Geographic as well for a documentary. There is a film being shown, uh, just the beginning, the first bit of it will be shown maybe next month, I think, at, in France, at this uh, Alpine um, Film Festival. Um, the last bit of this, it'll either be uh, come out in a like National Geographic series, uh, or there's this extra part that's going to be filmed in Antarctica next year. That'll probably complete it. Yeah, the whole story. And it is insane. I mean, I have to say it's insane. We could... Uh, Absolutely, yeah. I don't know, I really apologise for this, yeah, for the crashing here. Yeah, it's a, um, and I have to say too, in travelling that way, um, you're very close to the ground and you're seeing like every little feature. It was, it was quite an experience and after a while it's this silence, just that silence of the wind and the crunching and um, it's a completely different way to go. <laughs> That's a common question, actually. It's like is that your mother? Yes, it someone, is. you know, someone, someone asked me, wanted, wanted me to play up this some drama too. I say, you know, like because you see all this reality TV where it's scripted drama, you know, about everyone. Oh, no, I mean, the thing is that it's so it's already self-sorting, right? This fil the filter had already happened. Um, in order for you to even sign up on this trip, and for those guys to to do it, they've done it more than once. To go back, this is absolutely living in each other's. But like microverse, this is my microverse, and someone sticks a leg in it. You're like, get off, you know. No, we we got on really well. Um, it, it's not for everyone, obviously. It's like it is. Uh, it sounds a little bit setting it up a little bit, but it is a bit like space travel because you're in a very you're in this massive, massive space that will kill you, but you're in a tiny space, <laughs> and this is your tiny space, and um, you have to be very uh, at least at, at least when you're doing it, you have to be very stable. You know, very emotionally stable. You have to, if you don't have a sense of humour, don't get on. Uh, if, you, if you're not very, can't lock yourself down, so you're not going to do something stupid and kill everyone. Um, so everyone, everyone got on really well. I didn't, I didn't have a big enough knife. Uh, everyone else had big knives. <laughs> Next time, Nacho slept with two knives. <laughs> Maybe that was me. Um, no, we got on really well. I don't speak Spanish. Maybe that helped. <laughs> it's a Spanish wind sled. <laughs>